Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. And you are listening to the Financial Survival Network. It's Kerry Lutz. The date is Monday, November 24th. It's Thanksgiving week. We're going to be taking Thursday and probably Friday off, probably like the rest of you out there. But right now we are working full time and it's time for John Rubino talking about his most recent work. Most of the world panics. Is the U.S. next? And John Hey, good morning. And is the U.S. next? Morning, Carrie. Yeah, uh, I think eventually it has to be. Um, here's what happened in the last month to set the stage. Um, in late October, uh, J- Japan, who had already had a, a year of really aggressive monetary policy, you know, they they declared uh, their newest QE program about a year ago and had been pumping huge amounts of new money into the system for a year. And uh, uh, Japan's economy didn't respond to it. They they just dropped into recession. So um, Japan's um, leaders just announced a new stepped up quantitative easing program in which they're going to create um, new currency that, um, in terms of the size of their economy, is equivalent to about three trillion dollars a year in uh, in the U.S., which is huge. That's give or take about three times as big as our latest quantitative easing program. Which means they're just going to be shoveling cash out into the system at a rate that has never been seen before. You know, if the old stuff was experimental, this is uh, experimental cubed. You know, it's it's uh, something that nobody has ever tried before on this scale. Uh, and it's a sign of how nervous they are about their over-indebted economy dropping back into recession and, and deflation, which makes uh, debts infinitely harder to manage and brings you closer to the edge when you drop into a 1930s style um, depression. Not long after that, um, the European Central Bank, which had been operating on on fairly tight monetary policy for the past couple of years, um, finally gave up. You know, the, the eurozone has been dropping into um, near recession and deflation in which um, a, a, a lot of constituent countries were seeing prices actually go down rather than up. And again, that's a disaster for an over indebted society. So the, the European Central Bank just came out and um, Mario Draghi. The, the head of the ECB did one of his uh, whatever it takes kinds of announcements. But this time it is we will do whatever we must to raise inflation expectations as quickly as possible. Uh, and now they're buying asset backed bonds and other pieces of, you know, kind of crappy paper. It's not the kind of thing that central banks have traditionally trafficked in. But so the ECB is uh, is now engaged in really aggressive, somewhat experimental monetary policy. And, and then finally, China just recently um, is in the middle of a um, credit bubble bust. You know, they've borrowed huge amounts of money for the past five years, so something on the order of $15 trillion, which is about as big as the, the entire U.S. banking sector. And uh, they, they spent it on infrastructure, a lot of which really isn't generating the kind of cash needed to pay off the the related debts. And so they're starting to drop into something that looks an awful lot like um, U.S. circa 2007 with a, with a lot of different sectors on the verge of blowing up. And so they made a surprise interest rate cut announcement last week and, um, and added to it the expectation that they're going to do more interest rate cuts if needed. So now China is on board with, uh, with really aggressive monetary policy. So basically, you've got the whole world out there panicking because they're dropping into various forms of, uh, of recession and deflation and, and credit crisis. And so the question is, can the U.S. Uh, remain this island of relative stability when the whole rest of the world is, uh, is freaking out like this? And the reason that we probably can't is because, uh, you know, we had a relatively weak dollar for the past three years, which helped the U.S. grow and manage its debts and, and so kept us from uh, falling into the kinds of um, deflation slash recession that everybody else is in. Um, but 
all the policies that I just talked about around the world now are aimed at ultimately weakening the currencies. You know, the yen and the euro and the yuan all have to get less valuable now. And that's uh, that's how these economies are going to grow going forward to the extent that they grow at all. You know, they're going to cheapen their currencies, make exports easier to sell abroad and and in that way <clears throat> manage their debts. So what that means is that the dollar has to go up versus these currencies for these guys to be successful. And so if a weak dollar, relatively weak dollar, was one of the keys to the U.S. stability of the past few years, then a strong dollar is going to put us in the same position that uh, Europe and Japan and China found themselves in. Uh, that is uh, a, a strong currency, making exporting harder to do, slowing down the economy, leading to um, slower growth, possibly negative growth. and and possibly deflation in which prices start to go down instead of up. And, you know, that's a disaster for us, just as it is for them. So um, 2015 could be the year in which uh, the roles reverse, you know, and which is how it works in a currency war. You know, one, one country uh, cheapens its currency and does reasonably well for a while, but they do it at the expense of their trading partners. And then those guys have to retaliate by cheapening their currencies. And so we're at another stage of the currency war in which the rest of the world is devaluing their currencies which is the same thing as saying the dollar is going up dramatically. And so I have a chart on the, the article that I published in Dollar Collapse um, showing how dramatically the dollar has gone up lately. And it's up about 10% in, uh, in less than six months, which is a really big move in the currency markets. So um, let it just stabilize here. And we're probably looking at uh, dramatically slower than expected growth in 2015. And... Um, possibly a dip back into recession. So, you know, this should be a, a really eventful year in which there's kind of a changing of the guard. And that, though, that assumes that cheaper currencies work for Japan and Europe and China. And it's possible that they're so far gone, each in their own way, that uh, even the really aggressive monetary policies that they're, they're enacting now don't work anymore. And see, that's the end game. When, when we find out that... Uh, we have no tools left with which to manipulate the financial markets and then everything falls apart. So, you know, who knows when that happens, but this could be the time that it happens. So either we get um, relatively um, successful economic policies around the world and the U.S. dropping into recession or we get everything blowing up. And that's basically our only two choices. So 2015 will be a really, really interesting year because of the magnitude of the uh, the policies that are being attempted now. Yeah, well, as there was an article about this very thing in Zero Hedge, and they were talking that this kind of policy has never worked before. It hasn't worked uh, for the past uh, six years, and it's it's not going to work now, John. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, depreciating a currency, devaluing your currency does work in the short run in the sense that it allows you to sell more stuff overseas. But um, quantitative easing on the scale that we've tried it around the world hasn't um, led to raging economic growth, as you might expect, you know, in, in normal times, which is to say um, what we think of as normal, uh, the time since uh, World War II through the, the 1990s, for instance, you lower interest rates to near zero and you get a raging raging economic boom. You know, you get bull markets in every financial asset imaginable and you get the economy growing really dramatically. Well, we've lowered interest rates to zero around the world, pumped huge amounts of money into the banking system, and we've gotten a stock market explosion here. You know, we, we've had one of the steadiest bull markets in equity market history over the last five years. You know, no, no big corrections, um, higher year after year after year, because all this money's flowing into equities. But we, we haven't seen economic growth really anywhere. And uh, there's another chart from Zero Hedge that shows uh, the, the predictions for global GDP growth. And every year they start off high. You know, they start off three or four percent. We're, we're going to see the world grow in the next year. And then over the course of that year, they go down, 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 down until they're like at one percent. And then the next year starts off very optimistically again and drops again. So everybody expects quantitative easing to lead to reasonable economic growth. And it always fails. You know, that we're not seeing this money make its way to Main Street 
and so that we're, we're not seeing lots of small businesses get started and hire people and and um, those people then go out and spend money in other words organic growth that can uh, continue without continued in, infusions of new money we're not seeing that we're not seeing that anywhere and so in that sense, quantitative easing has just left us with another 15 or 20 or $30 trillion of debt, depending on how you calculate debt, and a, a global GDP that isn't any bigger than it was five or six years ago. And so that means we've just dug ourselves a little deeper into a hole, or actually much deeper into a hole, and we have no way of getting out of the hole. All we've got is this same program over and over again. We're going to increase the amount of money that our central banks create, and we're going to send it to the banks and see if it works. But the fact that uh, that we've tried it on a vast scale, on a completely unprecedented scale, and, and didn't get the results we were hoping for kind of implies that doing it on an even vaster scale is just going to dig us into an even deeper hole. And so that's what we're looking at going forward. Uh, these policies at some point are going to be seen to be failures. And they're going to be seen to carry with them all kinds of unintended consequences where to the extent that the, uh, the, the cure is worse than a disease. And at that point, people are going to wake up to the fact that, uh, that we don't have anything else. You know, there's nothing else to try and the stuff we've been doing doesn't work. So what now? And uh, the, the point at which that question becomes the headline uh, is going to be a fascinating time in the uh, in terms of economic theory, you know, we've never seen the world try this before. And uh, Austrian economics predicts that it will fail miserably. Keynesian economics predicts that if we just do it big enough, that it will succeed. And so we get to try these two theories out in the real world and see which one uh, wins. And right now, I've got to say the, uh, the Austrians are looking prescient. The Keynesians are looking uh, ineffectual. Uh, and we have another year of this to uh, to try it with even bigger numbers and see how it ends up. But I, I suspect that the Austrians are going to win out in the end. Yeah. And up next, we'll talk about when it's going to happen and what is going to happen next on the Financial Survival Network. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Worried about the coming dollar collapse? Then you need to speak to Tom Cloud today about buying gold and silver. It's the key to protecting your wealth from a declining dollar. Call him now at 800-247-2812. Tom will help you find the exact right bullion products to keep you safe. Would you believe that Tom's been in the business for 38 years? Tom understands these markets better than just about anybody. He's seen bull markets and he's seen bear markets and he's not worried and you shouldn't be either. When it comes to uncertain times like these, there's only one place to turn and that's gold and silver. And Tom's offering all FSN listeners free shipping and insurance. So call Tom now at 800-247-2812. That's 800-247-2812 or visit cloudhardassets.com and tell him Kerry sent you. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Hey, and you're listening to the Financial Survival Network. And in case you just joined us, we're talking with John Rubino of dollarcollapse.com and uh, co author of The Money Bubble, along with James Turk. So I guess sometime during the next year, you think uh, they're going to be forced to throw in the towel and they're going to have to try something. Now, Someone I talked with last week, Alistair McLeod, thinks that they're going to have to try fiscal stimulus because the central bankers, he thinks, in the latest G20 uh, summit told the uh, told the powers that be that, look, we've reached the end of the line with uh, with printing money. It's not working. It's never going to work. So you guys better better think of something else. And that's the only thing they know how to do. Fiscal stimulus, monetary stimulus, uh, the idea of cutting taxes cutting regulation and uh, relying upon individuals to actually uh, help grow the economy. They're just not going to do that. So what's your thoughts? Well, yeah, the, the, the Keynesian framework calls for fiscal stimulus as well as monetary stimulus, which is to say, borrow a whole bunch of money, spend it on infrastructure or or whatever, you know, and it, it really doesn't matter from a Keynesian point of view what you spend it on. Just uh, the, the fact that you've borrowed a bunch of money and spent it is what matters. That's called aggregate demand. And, and that's the key metric. 
in Keynesian economic theory. But of course, Japan has been trying this for the last 30 years now. Uh, they, they run huge deficits. They spend the money um, on propping up construction companies so that they can build more stuff and banks so that they can lend more money. And then they build roads and bridges and, and all the rest. And it hasn't worked. The Japanese economy is still flatlined uh, and government debt goes up year after year after year to the extent that uh, Japan, Japan's government um, owes more as a percent of GDP than any country in the world right now. And so, yeah, we'll adopt that. <laughs> that that's going to be one of the things that we will eventually try when, uh, when zero interest rates and debt buybacks and all the rest of the current monetary policy don't work. But of course, we'll, we'll probably get the Japanese result. You know, we'll, we'll borrow a lot more money. Our deficits in the U.S. will go back up to a trillion plus. We'll spend it on stuff and people will work at the projects that we spend the money on. But then when the project is over, the, the cash flow from that project won't generate enough to, uh, to keep those people employed and to pay off the related debts and, and all the rest. So we'll, we'll end up with a lot of malinvestment. In other words, stuff that shouldn't have been built in the first place, but is there now. And it's just eating cash rather than generating cash. And we, you know, we're there now, we already have a, a world of malinvestment and we will just build more, build more stuff that we don't need. And China also did that. You know, they pulled the, the global economy out of recession almost single handedly by borrowing all that money and building all those new cities and airports and roads and bridges. And now you've got empty cities and you've got airports with two or three planes coming and going in the course of a day. And uh, empty malls, and you know, which is empty malls is really a U.S. issue. <laughs> but uh, yeah. um, so China now is experiencing the the Japanese malaise only um, in a more compressed time frame. You know, they did um, what Jap what Japan did in twenty years, China did in five years, and so their consequences might also come in a, in a compressed time frame. And that's what they're really worried about. That's why they're cutting interest rates so aggressively. They don't want to fall off a, a cliff uh, like the world did in, in 2008, where uh, a couple of, um, of highly leveraged sectors just blow up and pull everything else down. So China's trying to short circuit that, but you know, so they're gonna do it with uh, um, more lending and more debt. And so that's really our only tool. And so when, when you try to separate fiscal policy from monetary policy in this framework, um, it doesn't really work because they're both, you know, they're each two sides of the, or they're the two sides of the same coin um, in which money gets borrowed somehow. And then it gets spent somehow, mostly on stuff that we didn't need and that doesn't uh, generate the kind of cash flow we expected. And so in the end, it doesn't work. So yeah, we'll, we'll try deficits, deficit spending on, um, on infrastructure next as part of our, our last desperate gasp. Um, and it won't work. And then we'll hit the point <laughs> when, when we realize it doesn't work. You know, it's, it's that point out there is what's interesting. All this flailing around in the meantime is just, to me, it's just uh, kind of killing time on the way to the big epiphany. And so I, I personally would just like to get there. You know, let's have everybody realize that this stuff doesn't work and then figure out what to do next um, with the knowledge that uh, Keynesian stimulus should not be what we try next. You know, let's see what we do try next. And, and you know, the, the Austrian remedy for too much debt is a debt liquidation. And that's extremely painful. And that's why it hasn't happened yet. And that's why it's, from a political standpoint, going to be a hard choice for whoever's in charge. So it's probable that the market ends up imposing it on us rather than it being a political choice. And so, you know, we'll have 2008, 2009 times three at some point, some huge, gigantic global crash in which huge amounts of debt get wiped out. And while that's happening, we have the conversation uh, about why what we tried in the last decade didn't work and what the theoretical and practical implications are of, uh, of debt-driven fiscal and monetary policy are. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll come up with some better ideas. 
where we go back to sound money and and we limit the size and scope of government and we uh, we shoot for one or two percent growth a year um, in, in in which savings get more valuable each year and savings are encouraged and debt is discouraged you know that kind of a system the kind of thing that we had uh, during the classical gold standard for most of 200 years prior to to world war one mm-hmm. and you know what what kind of sound money we adopt will have a lot to do with what is technologically viable at the time. Maybe it'll be uh, uh, some kind of cryptocurrency. Maybe it'll be a, a gold standard combined with some kind of electronic payment system. Who knows? But uh, we, we need to go back to something that limits the ability of governments and big banks to just create money out of thin air. And it would be really nice if we got there soon. You know, <laughs> this waiting around is, uh, is frustrating. Because in a lot of ways, it's the same story. You know, what we're talking about right now, Carrie, is the same thing you and I talked about a decade ago. Mm-hmm. And it's just that the numbers are way bigger. So um, as long as you can remember the new numbers, you don't really have to learn a whole lot that's new <laughs> to have this conversation. Yeah. You just uh, you insert 10 trillion for um, half a trillion and, and you're saying the same thing, you know, and, and uh, I so personally, I'm, I'm kind of bored with the story. I would like it to be over with. I would like us to get to the point where we realize that what we're doing doesn't work. And then then we have the interesting conversation. Well, what will work if this doesn't? So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, well, it's a death by a trillion cuts, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, the fact that it's global is why it's been able to um, to hang on for such a long time, because um, past major financial crises were largely one country screwing up. And then maybe it had effects on other countries, but it uh, it, it didn't affect the global economy <clears throat> in the way that, uh, that what we're doing now does. So now we can have one country... Um, operate uh, a, a massive QE program and, and uh, currency devaluation and, uh, and hang in for a while. And then the other countries who are affected by that jump in and do their own version of QE and, and, uh, and debt monetization and, and currency devaluation. And so they can go back and forth for a lot longer since everybody's yeah. doing it than yeah. when one country screws up. Well, hey, that's, uh, I'm sure you're correct. I'm sure that's what we're going to see more of. But uh, till that day, we are stuck in the money bubble. Anyway, check out John's work at dollarcollapse.com. Uh, pretty much uh, work coming out of there daily, especially now that winter's coming. And John will be uh, housebound. And uh, you can always find the link uh, in the show notes to this interview on financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Make sure you sign up for a newsletter. Got a webinar coming up tomorrow at 9 p.m. Um you know, just find the link upper left-hand corner of the website. Uh, we'll be having uh, Craig Hempke, a.k.a. Turd Ferguson, talking about what's next for gold and silver. You don't want to miss it, so sign up. It's free. John, we'll talk to you next Monday. See you then, Kerry. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Every week the show is growing. Would you like to be a part of it? Then go to clubfsn.com and help support us with one, two, five, or ten dollars a month and get a host of premium content with newsletters dropped into your mailbox, free books, private audio clips, webinars, and much more. Then join clubfsn.com. If you want to get ahead of the trend and ensure your family's financial security before it's too late, go to clubfsn.com and sign up. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.